robe of righteousness and garments of salvation. You're already clothed in His majesty and His glory. You're already clothed. You don't have to go get dressed. He dressed you the day you said yes to the cross. Think about what you're dressed with. The glorious King. Our soon coming King. It says that you're wrapped in it. You're wrapped in salvation and righteousness. That's who He is. He is glorious. So when you see yourselves from now on, see who has dressed you and who you're dressed in. Paul said, we're clothed with Christ. That's what that means. It's out of Isaiah 61. It's so important that we see ourselves as who we really belong to. Like I said, I don't really belong to my wife. I belong to Jesus. That's part of the gift of being, walking with Jesus. See, that's a gift. He owns her, though. Remember that we talked about that before. And we don't own people. You don't own your spouse. You don't own your children. They're a gift from God. He owns us. But when you see whose bride you really are, that'll change the way you see yourself and the way you see others. Amen? Amen. Amen. That was so good. Oh God, how I need you. Like I said, it didn't do a lot of studying when I was young, so now I have to have a dictionary around. One for the Bible, one for a regular one. That word need. When I looked it up in the dictionary, what it really means. A necessity or obligation created by some situation. No need to worry, really. How many of you battle not worrying? Come on now. There you go. We got parents, grandparents in here, please. Come on. God says, don't worry, fear not. And we still worry and fear. Okay, a lack of something useful, required or desired, to have need of rest. Something useful, required, desired, that is lacking, a want, a requirement to list your daily needs. God already says, I'm going to supply all your needs before you even ask me. I know what you need before you ask, so why do you go back to God with a whole list of what you need? See, that word need has a whole lot of meaning, doesn't it? I, should, I could have done about a 12-part teaching just on this one word. Because it means so much scripturally when I started reading it. And then it says, it gets more serious. A condition in which there is a deficiency of something or one requiring relief or supply. A condition of poverty or extreme want. There isn't a soul walk on the planet unless they are born again, spirit-filled believer in Jesus Christ, they are poverty-stricken. You could have $20 billion in the bank, but if you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. You are a poverty-stricken person without God. Oh, hallelujah. It's going to be a good day. He's going to set some people free today. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In Psalm 18, if you have your Bibles, We're going to talk about two very needy people, King David and Paul. Very needy people, but they knew who to go to. How many of us as, as believers in Christ Jesus go to man first for counsel, for wisdom, for comfort, for joy, for understanding, for direction, instead of the Prince of Peace, the Mighty Counselor, who wrote your life story before he made the universe? Psalm 139. In Psalm 18, David, what he's doing here, I'm going to show you in a minute. This is towards the end of his life, actually. The, the Psalms aren't on chronological order. But he's writing about something from way back here, which you're going to see in a minute. What he's doing is he's giving testimony of who God is. Because once you've been born again long enough, you've seen God deliver over and over and over and over, and over, and over, and over. He's never failed. He doesn't know how. So when you cry out, Oh God, I need you. These two men of God, every time they cried out to God, He answered. The Bible says, Call upon His name. He will answer, honor, rescue, and deliver you. It's a promise from your Maker, your Savior, the one who died for you, the one who loves you without measure and without condition. Amen? So this is David talking about something that happened way back when. The pangs of death surrounded me, verses 4 to 6 in Psalm 18. The floods of ungodliness made me afraid. 
The sorrows of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord. I cried out to my God. He heard my voice from His temple. My cry came before Him, even to His ears. David, when you study his life, never cried out to man for help. Didn't cry out to his armies. Never. When you go back and study David's life, he always went to God. Because from the time he was a boy out there tending the flocks, he took down bears and lions, protected the sheep from robbers and thieves, and poisoned water and poisoned plants. He was alone with those animals and with his God. So from the time he was here, he was the runt of the litter, remember that. God raised him up, though, because everybody else looked like a king but David. But who did he raise up the mightiest? The one that looked least likely. So next time somebody tells you you're, you're least likely, think of Paul, who was another one who was short in stature, didn't look like much, but he went from Saul to Paul in a moment's time. So what you're going to see today is these men of God never went to man for deliverance, for counsel, for wisdom, for protection, for provision. They never went and looked at man. You need to help me. No, they went to God. God will make it rain down money from heaven, food from heaven, protection from heaven. His angels come around us to guard us every step of the way. It says so in the book. So why do these men of God look to God for everything, and yet we got an instruction manual here that says don't go to man because they're going to let you down. Go to God because He can. Because He's faithful and true is His name. Amen? Amen? I got done with this the other night, and of course, as usual, by last night and this morning, everything changed, like it does every week. It's, it's, it's a pattern with the Lord and I. He starts me and then stops me and says, no, I don't want that, I want this. Okay, thank you. Let's tear everything up and start all over again. So I, one thing about computers, you just hit that backspace and erases everything you just typed. It's great. <laughs> David, what he was doing here in Psalm 18, you'll see in a minute, he was telling people, remember what God did back here. He always put God in remembrance. They always, remember something, everything was handed down by word of mouth back then. Okay, everything was handed generation to generation because they only had so many scrolls to write on. So the word of God was very limited who actually had it in writing. Even in the Old Testament, only they were in so many temples. Everything else was generation to generation, from the grandparents to the parents to the children to the great-grandchildren. So given testimony, they had great memories back then because they always, they always put God, what He did back here, what He did back here, what He did back here. Why don't we do the same? How many times do you come up against something and go, where are you? Did you forget the last 400 times He met your need? See what I'm saying? And in Isaiah 43, 25 and 26, just write that down. You don't need to go there. It says, put God in remembrance. I am and I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case that you may be acquitted. David, in this psalm, when he goes back, because the next couple of verses, it says, he, when he cried out, God answered. How did he answer? The earth shook, the heavens thundered, and protection came down from heaven. He was, God's telling us, remember what I've done for you all along. Don't be so quick to forget all the times God showed up in our lives and said, here I got you, here I got you, here I got you. Because if you're like me, and you look back at your life and go, Oh, especially all those years in the streets, for me, when I watched God was with me that whole time, when He had every right to turn His back on me and let me burn and perish in eternal darkness. Yet He was watching over me all those years in the streets, doing every kind of evil known to man. I think I made up some new ones. But yet God was there. And He showed His great mercy and His great love for me. How I don't know He can love us that much, I don't know. I'll know that when I get home and so will all of us. But to sit there and see how he protected me all those years in the streets, guns going off, guns being put to your head, not going off, misfiring with a bug bow shotgun right here. Try that sometime. <laughs> Drug deal gone bad. Have both barrels right here. They didn't go off. And God was with me. God was with me. How can we forget and not put God in remembrance every day we get up? Because He's been there for every one, one of us. Oh God, how I need Thee. 
No, it's not how I need. I need you every second of every day because apart from Jesus, I can do nothing. I saw my life for 37 years without Jesus Christ. And I thank God for the power of that blood because I don't have a past. I have a hope and a future in Jesus and so do all of you. Never look over your shoulder again. You've done no wrong in God's eyes because he just said for his name's sake, he doesn't keep a record. Imagine if God kept a record. No. <laughs> we talk, that's why I talk about the power of Jesus' name, the power of the blood of the redeeming power of the blood of the cross of Christ. It is so important. We always put that in remembrance. God, look what you did for me. How can we ever think he's not going to come through? He may not come through the way you want him. You may want a Ferrari, you're going to get a Chevy Impala. Okay. We may have a difference of opinion on what you need. <laughs> oh, I got them all laughing. See, that that was good. Amen. Amen. <laughs> For Hunter, we got to get a little bit longer, Carl. You grow any taller. What's your food bill now? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> But this was at the end of David's life, actually, when he was doing Psalm 18. Because further down, you go to 2 Samuel 21. Go back and read 15 to 22 sometime. Because back there, that's where David was, was actually talking about here. He was actually talking about, in 2 Samuel, it says, David and his men destroyed the Philistine giants. That was at the end of David's life. And he grew faint. His, his warriors came to him and protected him. David almost got slayed that day. And the warriors came up and took down a couple of giants around him that were about to kill him and said, no, the lamb can't go out in Israel. The lamb can't go out. You're not going anywhere until your time's up. Amen. You're here because God wants you here because you've got work to do for God's glory. But you're not going to do the work the Holy Spirit's going to do it through you. We have to go back into a mentality of always putting in remembrance one of the main reasons he died. He said, I must die this way so the Holy Spirit, my life will come live in you. Because I know you can't do it alone. I know you can't do it alone. You need my power. You need my wisdom. You need my discernment. You need my understanding. You need my great grace that we sang about today that followed us from heaven to the cross, from the cross to the grave, from the grave back to the right hand of the Father. Grace chased us down all the way around. He started in heaven and He came down. Grace rose again that day. Unmerited favor to save people such as us. Amen? Amen. So it was at the end of David's life, he was letting all of Israel and everybody know, look what God has done all these years. He was talking about all the way back in, in uh, 1 Samuel, I think, yeah, or 2 Samuel. And then we go into 2 Samuel 22. Psalm 18 and, and 2 Samuel 22, you go back and read that 22nd chapter of Samuel, you're going to see Psalm 18 was back then. It was a song that David sang to God back then. So what he's saying in Psalm 18 towards the end of his life, this is what God has done. I put him in remembrance and so do we need to. Because when you think about how much God has done for you over your journey on this planet, because it's a journey one day at a time, one day at a time. Stop worrying about tomorrow morning. Don't go there. Focus on today so God can use you mightily today. Not tomorrow. Tomorrows don't matter. They really don't. Because God already knows tomorrow. Yesterday is already way behind you. It should be. You shouldn't have brought yesterday with you today. Because if you brought yesterday today, you've got a weight on your back you shouldn't have. He's come to set you free from burdens. The only thing you carry is the grace of God in your heart to go out and love the lost. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. In 2 Samuel 22, verses 1-4, to this is the same beginning of Psalm 18. This putting God in remembrance is so important for us as His children. Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. <laughs> Talk about preparation. <laughs> Saul chasing him for 12, 13 years, trying to kill him every day. <laughs> and then he got the throne. Okay. And he said, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, the God of my strength in whom I will trust. My shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, my refuge, my Savior. You save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. 
so shall it be saved from my enemies. All the way back here, when he took down all the giants, won all those battles, killed tens of thousands at a time, here he is at the end of his life saying, look what God has done. Look what God has done. It's never changed. All the way up into Psalm 18 where he's at the end of his life, he's reminding everybody of God's great power. The horn. He's the horn of his salvation. That's your covering from heaven. You've got heaven over you to protect you. That horn is a, is a sign of strength. It was always a sign of strength and power. So when he says the horn of my salvation, that's God himself over you. Remember who you're crowned with. Loving kindness and tender mercies. You're crowned with the protection of Almighty God. Boy, how many times can you, all of you look back and go, man, you were there then, 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 then. Don't tell me you can't list it because I'm not the only one here. God's been faithful to all of us or we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be here today celebrating Mother's Day, celebrating our salvation, celebrating God's goodness, singing glorious, singing about eternity. Remember Ecclesiastes 3.11, you already have eternity in your heart. Stop searching for it, it's already in you. You're already eternally redeemed. So don't worry about the eternal part because this is a temporary stopover. But make the most out of your life today because the world needs you to. Does God need us? Yeah, kind of. Because to fulfill the prophetic word of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, He needs us to bring that to fruition. Can God replace us? You bet He can. I was told when I first started out in ministry before my first Sunday school class, you don't do it my way, I'll find somebody that will. I was a brand new Christian. I'm like, excuse me. <laughs> I heard that voice in my heart, but I put a fear in there. Wow, I'm called to something. Because I just come out of the streets. And you come out of the streets and now you got a room full of kids anyways between 8 and 14 years old. They're looking to you for direction. And God says, if you don't do this right, I'll get rid of you and I'll get somebody that will. That was a brand new Christian. I saved three months. I'm going, wait a minute. And he says, oh, no, no, no. You represent me now. Those kids are mine. Make sure you do it right. Holy cow. You talk about changing a new believer's outlook on life. I was in there, oh, this will be a piece of cake. I got my little Bible study, my Sunday school class ready. And then the Lord spoke to me that Saturday night and said, oh, no, 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 no. This is a lot more. This smile you got, that's all that grace you got because you just started. Because I was still all happy. I was walking around feeling real good about myself. I didn't know what was still left of me yet. He hadn't thought that version. Oh, God. Oh, God. Not Kimberly, but the rest of us. <laughs> you didn't think I was going to leave you out today, did you? <laughs> oh, we missed you. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. But it's so important. Even in Psalm 18, 1, David started out in that song. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. See, David through his whole life, I love you, O Lord, my strength. My soul cries to thee, O God, my strength. My expectation is in thee, O God. Psalm 62, 5. From in his inside being, David cried out to God because he knew God would always answer. He always answered. Until he dropped the ball there. Read Psalm 51. That's, that's a whole other ball game. He stayed home and trouble came knocking. Mm -hmm. Don't ever forget to put God in remembrance. David never did. He never lost a battle. He lost the battle against his flesh when he stood on his castle. He didn't call out to God. He says, well, I'm going to stay home today. He decided to. He stayed home. And that was the day his flesh came for him. Because he didn't acknowledge God. I'm going to go up on my castle. Oh! Oh, she got no clothes on. It's that subtle, but it's also that tricky. This stuff is tricky. Did Jesus overcome sin and death? Yes. Did He overcome the power of your flesh? Yes. But don't think you can keep it. Your keeper is Jesus Christ. That's why He gave us the Holy Spirit. So His strength will keep us from wandering. We just did a whole thing. Wednesday night, three weeks ago, we did three weeks of walking on that journey to the cross. He will keep you on the highway of holiness if you allow Him to. God is also a gentleman. Doesn't have to be, but He is. He says if you choose your free will, you choose to exercise it, okay. That's not my plan for you. Because when you exercise your free will, there are what is known as consequences. 
Show up for your job four days in a row late. We'll see what happens on the fifth if you get that far. You'd be out of a job. See, God's merciful, understanding, forgiving. But you keep exercising your free will, there'll be a correction. Amen. Anybody ever been corrected by God besides me? Yeah, thank you. I got company. Thank you, Jesus. Let's talk a little bit about Paul. Now again, we're going to talk about Paul right here towards the end of his life. See, that's why God had me use these two men, because it's so important that we see after so many years, we really shouldn't be questioning God much anymore. We should know God has always been faithful and true. That God has never come to harm you, but to prosper you, give you a hope in the future. That's what God came for. To set us free from the bonds of the law, which gives you an earning, striving mentality of trying to earn God's favor. No, His unmerited favor came from heaven to the cross, from the cross back to the right hand of the Father. The grace came so that we don't have to strive anymore. So we listen and obey and follow. We follow Jesus. He makes the way when there's not a way. If you're striving in your life, you know what? You've grabbed the world, you've put it in the backpack, and you put it on your back, and you're carrying it. I have to go do. Did you ask God what you were supposed to do that day? Did you say, God, I'm striving here. Your word says, that cease striving, know that I am God. I'll be exalted above the heavens and the earth. If you are striving, and you're not walking in peace, then you put burdens on yourself, God never will. Because He came to set you free from the burdens of life. Because God says, I'm going to protect you, I'm going to guard you, I'm going to heal you, I'm going to prosper you, I'm going to give you wisdom and knowledge and understanding, I'm going to order your steps. See, there's no striving in any of that because you're not the one doing it. You're just listening. We're just listening. I want to walk in the ways of peace. I tell people, where's your peace? Oh, I'm walking with Jesus. I got it all together. I'm really doing good. And I'm like... I gotta go do this, and I gotta go do that, and I gotta go do this, and I gotta go do that, and I'm like, what book are you reading? Because it isn't that one. He's the Prince of Peace. If you're not walking in peace, you're walking on your own journey. God is the God of peace. Like I said, this whole world could that mountain could start falling out there. Things could start falling out of the heavens. I'm just gonna keep right on preaching. And then when we're done, I'll be praying for people because that won't touch this because this is God's house. This is God's house. God says, I put a covering over you. I got heaven over you. All the protection of heaven is over us in here. That's why so much goes on here. That's why so many people get healed here. That's why so many lives get changed here because this is God's ministry. It belongs to Him. He's the head of this body of believers. Amen. Not me. Like I said, pastor may be on the card, but I know who the boss is in here. And it's not me. I checked this morning when he had me up at 5 something changing the sermon around. He says, I'm the boss. You listen and obey. I got it from there. You know your life should actually be that simple? Yes. Do you have families? Do you have bills? Do you have responsibilities? Yes. Yes, you do. But God will hold your hand through every one of them. He'll hold your hand. Remember who you're married to. Remember who you're married to. Don't get them going, oh my God, I need this, I need this, and it's three weeks away. That means you're worried about tomorrow, and tomorrow hasn't even gotten here yet. When the Bible says, don't even worry about your tomorrows, they'll get here. I got your tomorrows covered. Because if you put me in the remembrance, you'll see all I've done for you since the day you were born. How I've provided for you, how I've protected you from evil. Like I said, maybe for me it's a little different coming out of the streets all the times that things went wrong, where I have no right to be here being medically dead half a dozen times, breaking everything in my body and then God restoring me, feeling better going on 60 than when I was 20. God can do something with a vessel, okay? So I know He restores. I know He'll keep me fresh and flourishing because He said so. Not because any man told me, but because God showed me this Word can't be hindered nor contained. And every promise in here is yes and amen to me. It's a personal book. And it should be personal to all of you. This is a promise from God to every one of us. Do you know that? Yes. And it is sealed in His blood. Mm, it's sealed in His blood. Put in remembrance all that God has done for you today. And this world won't touch you anymore. Nor the concerns of it. Because you'll see the one that's got your back. He's got your front. He's got your sides. 
That glory cloud will be all around you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. In 2 Timothy 4. Mm -mm. 17 to 18. Now these verses here, Paul was talking about, he talked about being forsaken. God can't. We're going to get to that in a minute. But guess what? He's talking about when he's writing to Timothy, he's at the end of his life. He knows his days are over. He, I, I do. He was looking out the window waiting for that guillotine. Let me get there. <laughs> he was going. <laughs> I'm going to heaven. Bye now. Bye now. I'm out of here. Love you all, but I'm leaving. <laughs> Time for me to go. Because he says, what did Paul say back in, what was it, Romans or Acts? He says, this temporary suffering is but a moment. Of course I'd rather go and be with Jesus. But I stay on that the gospel be furthered. God get more glory through me. That's what he was saying. You should never want to go home and be with Jesus. Not even think that thought until you're finished here. Because somebody in this world today needs you. They need to hear what God has put inside of you to feed them spiritually. God needs you to bring his life to people. That's why he came. He came so his life can emanate out of you and touch people. When, if you think, man, I, I need to get out of here. It's time for me to go. I can't take it no more. You've all thought it, and so have I. I've seen heaven, remember? I've seen his face. So guess what? I know this world is really temporal. When you die a few times and you leave your body and you're looking down at people pumping you, getting your heart going again, and you're sitting there going, what are you doing? That changes your whole perspective on life. Let me tell you it does. <laughs> Let me tell you it does. <laughs> when you got doctors looking you in the face saying, Ah, you got anywhere from 30 days to 6 months to live? That was before I surrendered to Christ. When you could smell my skin, I was dying. When, you, when you're there, and then God says, Like in football, time out. I got a plan. That's the best day of my life. When I said yes to Jesus. Because what the world said meant nothing. I found that out that Sunday morning. One Sunday morning, I said yes to Jesus, and my life has never been the same. And it's just beginning. We're in the most exciting times in the history of humanity. Our soon coming king is going to do a great outpouring like we've never known. He's going to make a name for himself like nobody's ever known. And everybody's going to acknowledge that he is Lord of all, and he rules and reigns, and no one else rules and reigns but Jesus. There is no other religions. There is no other way into heaven. There's one road, and it's through the cross at Calvary. We need to go back to that message. Because the more I think of the cross, I got one little thing hanging in my mirror in my car, and it's a cross. I get in there when I get in every day, and I look at that cross, and I know the day's taken care of. Because the cross is in my windshield, not what's in, not down the road. The cross I see when I get in the car. So I know who goes with me. When you get up every morning, you should know who's with you, whose bride you are, who you belong to. Stop forgetting what He's already done for you. Remind yourself every day, God, you died for me. You saved me. You redeemed me from a life of darkness to walk in holiness and righteousness and power. You said you'll guard my going out and my coming in. You'll surround me with favors with a shield. God will protect you from every form of evil. It says so. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. Thank you, Stop forgetting what God has done. Praise Him for what He's done yes, for you Lord. today. And then watch His grace abound in your life. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. And Paul saying at the end of his journey, but the Lord stood with me. Now this is after he told Timothy, everybody's left me. I'm all done here. I'm in a prison. I'm in trouble. There's a man all those years serving God. But look what he says. It was okay they all left. He was hurt by it, I'm sure. Everybody gets hurt. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for His heavenly kingdom. To Him be glory and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. See what he said? He's at the end of his life, delivered from the lion. Everybody had forsaken him, but he praised God for his faithfulness and his goodness that he was always going to strengthen him and carry him and protect him from every evil work. Stop looking at the evil. Start looking at the one that overcame it. 
You know what? If you're looking at God and His power and His love for you, evil will run from you. It, it will know it can't touch you. Because you know what evil sees? The garment of salvation and the robe of righteousness. God's glory around you. It won't want anything to do with you. Because it knows... Because darkness and light can't mix. And His light is hot. Darkness gets near that light and it's going to get burned up before it ever touches you. You're a holy vessel. A holy priesthood. A holy nation of believers. Hallelujah. I shared that with Adam at the end of his life. Now, at the beginning of his journey with Jesus, remember, he was Saul. Everybody forgets. They don't talk about Paul, Paul, Paul. They forget he was Saul. He was a murderer. He was a murderer. Paul was a murderer. Back in Acts 9, this is after his encounter with the holy righteous God that blinded him and knocked him off his horse. But in Acts 9, I'm just going to read the one verse. In verse 15, Ananias was a holy man of God. The Lord visited him and said, Hey, you go pray for, for Saul. I'm going to take those scales off his eyes. You're going to anoint him with the Holy Spirit, really? I know that man. He's a murderer. He's killing your children. Wait a minute. The mom, huh? How many times has God told you to go do something you want? Excuse me? Do you know what they're like? No, he missed it. He missed that person. He knows everything. He knows exactly what he's saying and why he's Amen. saying it. It's so important when God tells us to do something, we go do it. Charles Stanley did a great teaching. Pray, obey, listen, leave the consequences up to God. Because if you're obedient to God and you do what you're told, the consequences are his responsibility, not yours. So Ananias did as he was told, and as they say, the rest is history. Because in verse 15... It says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. You're a chosen generation. Every one of you is a chosen vessel by God today. Amen? Amen. To bear my name before the Gentiles, before kings, the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Ow! Gets knocked off the horse, gets blinded, doesn't eat or drink for three days, then he tells Ananias to go anoint them. Whoa. God didn't tell you to go hug somebody you thought was unhuggable. Mm -hmm. Guy yeah, has. And you went, ooh, really? I come from those streets. And I was worse than anybody you've seen in this time. People hugged me. They loved me. That's why I stand here today. Because somebody told me I was loved. And they, they hugged an unlovable man. An evil, dirty man. They loved me, they hugged me, they embraced me, they never judged me. Because like Ananias, he looked at Paul, that's what they saw. You don't want him. God said, yes I do. He's just what I'm looking for. Because I have chosen him. You are all chosen. And so is everybody out here. He desires that none should perish in Peter. None, but all come to the salvation, the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why God is so long-suffering. That's why His righteous right arm is keeping the end from getting here. Because He wants all these people saved. The visions we've seen for the city have not happened yet. We need to press into God like never Amen. before. And just embrace Him like never before. Have Him take preeminence in every day that you're here on this earth. Because if He's sovereign and Lord over your life, this world can't have you, can't touch you, can't hinder your Amen. walk. Because God will go before you and make a way. Not you. You're going to find out in a minute about that. Because He fights all your battles. It says so. So many Christians today, do I war in the Spirit when I'm praying in the Spirit at home on my knees? When I'm up half the nights praying in tongues and interceding and you feel all the darkness out there? Yes. But God goes before me. God has overcome sin and death. God says, I've overcome the world and everything in it. So when the world says something to you, say, take it up with Jesus. Because He's already overcome you and all your so-called man-made power. It means nothing to God. He laughs at the power of man, the power of nations. All these rulers of the world today think they're all that in a bag of chips like my wife would say. I love that term. But guess what? God's hand's going to reach down on that bag of chips and He's going to go squish. Because this is His planet, this is His universe, and He rules and reigns here. Amen. And we need to go back to who we belong to. Look at what God has done from the beginning. When you read the Old Testament, you see how they kept going back to darkness. Back to darkness. Back to darkness. Back to darkness. 
he broke the power of darkness to hold you any longer. Darkness should run from us as his children. Do you struggle? You bet you do. God's been taking me through stuff for the last six months to show me just how weak and hopeless I am without him. Just so I don't get out of bed and try and go do it on my own human power. My own human abilities. Because that gets me in trouble. Every time I start, well, I think I can do this, this, and this, then the thorns start coming. Go find out last week I got a new one now. So, my new little thorn is there on a constant reminder. I asked him about it early this morning when I felt the little twinge. He said, I said I want you up now. I wanted to stay under the blankets because they were real comfortable. <laughs> that pillow was just right. You know, you get in that position sometimes, you get real comfy. And then all of a sudden, that new thorn he's giving me started to push. I went, oh, you do want me up, don't you? Now. Okay, then. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Because he wanted to talk to me and get me ready for the day. He wanted to show me how much he loves us, how much he's over us, and how much he's in charge. So when I walk out the door and we, come, we start coming here in the morning, there's nothing before me because God's already made a way. Amen. I didn't have a concern coming here this morning. Not one. Because the first thing, I was up this morning I went before God. Right there, I know I'm okay. Because if I'm not okay, He's going to show me. <laughs> and we need to correct something. Because you all need correction every day. Don't say you don't. We all fall short of His glory. It's in here. I've read it. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. But remember something. Paul knew. From that day forward, God visited him when he was blind and showed him the things he was going to suffer. The shipwrecks, the beatings, the stones, the imprisonments, and all this other stuff. And he said, yes. He said, yes. And then at the end of his life, he, he was heartbroken. People forsook him, but he knew God never did. He put God in remembrance at the end of his life. He's always delivered me. David, he's always delivered me. He always delivered me. Both men of God, both short in stature, both you would look at by their appearance and go, these aren't mighty men of God. No, God was mighty in them. They knew a mighty God who was always there for them. They always put God in remembrance first. Both men called on God first and not man. And look how God raised those two men up. The two least likely in the Bible to be raised so mightily. For God to do such great stuff with. That people look down on. Paul, he couldn't speak well and all the other stuff, but yet he was more educated than all the men of his days. He was smarter than all the educated teachers, and he considered his knowledge of God before salvation and the Holy Spirit dumb in the King James. That's how much he thought of all of his so-called stuff that he had learned. It wasn't worth it. It was the knowledge of God and knowing him more day by day. Your hunger should be to have a deeper, more intimate relationship every minute you're here. Because you can have it. You can have a oneness with God like no, nothing else. Not even with your spouses. Not even with your husband and wives. The intimacy you can have with God. Who, God knows you a lot better than your spouse does. My wife's pretty much got me figured out. She just laughs at me half the time. Oh, no. uh, oh she's got me down. <laughs> Look at her back there biting the lip. Yeah, you smile. You know me. Um, but she knows me because God showed her stuff. We love each other through Jesus. Not through each other. And that's important for all of you. You need to love the lost again through Jesus. Don't see them like Ananias saw Paul, Saul before he became Paul. Don't see people like that. See them through God's eyes as lost souls that need Jesus. Amen. Same thing with David. They brought out all his brothers. Big, strong guys. Oh, that's a king. That's a king. That's a king. That's a king. Samuel said, psh, psh. where's the other one? They didn't want to bring him. No, he's out in the field. No, bring him. These are not the king. Here comes David. I can't imagine how scruffy he looked being out in the fields all day and night because I told you what a shepherd does. It sleeps with the flock. It sleeps at the gate because they have a hedge around them and it protects the flock. He slept at the door of the gate to the sheep every night out in the fields with him and God. God was preparing him to be king in those fields every single day. He was alone with his maker and those animals. He knew what it was to be a shepherd. You gotta learn how to be a shepherd before you can just take on the mantle and be one. I told you when he changed me from evangelist to pastor, I went, You've got to be kidding. He said, I never kid. So we all know my wrestling match with that transformation. Because you have to take more of the shepherd's heart, the father's heart, that cares for the whole body, the whole flock. 
But God wants us all in one respect. You're all a shepherd of the lost, actually, because you're all a son and daughter of Jesus Christ. All of us are called and chosen, the Bible says, to go out and further the kingdom of God, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. You don't go to school for it. You've got to ears to listen to what the Spirit would tell you. Just read the book. You don't need to quote chapter and verse. You read the book enough, and the verses will come out of you. And then the Word of God and the Holy Spirit will draw them to Him. It's not your job from that point on. You've done your part. You planted, you watered. Let God's grace do the rest. Amen. Stop putting so much pressure on yourself to be some kind of mighty person of God. There's no such thing as a great man or woman of God. There's not one on the planet. God does great things with willing vessels that will deny themselves and die to themselves so the life of Christ can come out of us. 2 Corinthians 4th chapter, His life is to be manifested through us. That's what's going to touch people. That's what's going to draw them to salvation. When they feel Jesus' love coming out of you, that will change people. But don't be an Ananias and don't be like uh, David's dad and, and his brothers. No, they're just, they're no good. You don't want them. Yes, God does want them. Like I said, I'm living proof God takes the worst of the worst and can change them. Because I was on death row and so were all of you before salvation. Amen? Amen. 1 Samuel 17. This is the story of David and Goliath. This is what I said, God goes before you. So many of us to get into battles with people, with circumstances. How's God going to deliver you when you're doing the battle? Because it's going to, I'm going to show you two verses right now. You're having battles in your life that He's already dealt with. He's already taken care of them. Because you're fighting through your natural person instead of the supernatural God that's overcome the world. Look what David says. <clears throat> Then all this assembly shall know, 1747, 1 Samuel, <laughs> shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. How many of you look to God and try and tell Him how things need to work out? I got company. I got company. I do, I do. Thank you. But guess what, though? The battle is the Lord's. He, he'll come in ways you don't know because He's so far above us. And Isaiah says His thoughts and His ways are higher than ours. That's like people tell me, I got God all figured out. Really, God bless you. Write a book or something. We're going to get rid of you real quick. <laughs> because today somebody's got God figured out. You go to, you know, when we leave this world and we go to our real home, when life really begins, you, the Bible says you're going to learn about Him forever. Eternity has no beginning and no ending. So how much are you going to learn here about God? Um, I, like I said, I thought I learned a lot about God when I was a young Christian, and then he turned me to Psalm, I think it's 94 or 11, somewhere around there. I know the thoughts of man, they are futile. He calls us sheep. Not because we're the smartest pumpkins in the patch, okay? Um, so, he, he reminds us how little we do know. But the minds you have, the thoughts you have, the abilities you have were given to you by God. Now give all your abilities back to God so He can use them for His glory. Because every gifting you have in there, I don't care if it's an auto mechanic, it's a house builder, it's a computer worker. I don't care what it is, whether it's making clothes, building, no matter what your skill set is, God gave you that. And it says, do all works and labors that you would that He be glorified. Colossians 3.24. It's so important that we go back to the gifting that God put in you. Because the natural gifting you had, He's put you somewhere so you can have a godly impact. That gifting He's given you, you should be doing your job better than anybody else. Not striving, but walking in the wisdom God will give you to be better than the rest. Because people say, wow, how, how do you do all that? Jesus. That's an open door for you to tell them who's gifted you. And who's enabled you with the abilities you have? So many of us take our, our God-given abilities as something we earned or deserved. No, you got those abilities from your Maker. So that He could use them for His glory. Remember, you were created for His glory only. Isaiah 43, 7. These are the things that God reminds me of when I get a little ahead of Him. Then the Word comes and corrects me. Who were you made for? You use that word I again, Dennis? Oh! See, as soon as you use the word I, 
You've forgotten who you belong to, by the way. <laughs> Remember, you gave up your rights when you said, You're my Lord and Savior. I believe it in my heart and I confess it with my mouth every day. When you said that, you gave up your rights. It's not like a contract you signed for a car or a home or a business deal. His contract is sealed with His blood. Put that in remembrance every day when you realize who you belong to, who died for you, who shed His blood, and by His stripes you are healed. All that He has done for you, when you put Him in remembrance every day of all He's done for you, even up to now, your future gets that much brighter. It says in the Proverbs, as you walk on this earth, your days should get brighter and brighter unto the noonday sun. That's waiting for His return. So each day should be brighter and brighter, not dimmer and dimmer. I'm not going to die old. I'm going to die when my time's up. Because I'm not going to die, I'm going to live forever. This is going to go. Praise God. <laughs> what a glorious day that's going to be. No wrestling matches. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> oh, so. All right, now the battle is lost. Proverbs 21, 30 to 31. There is no wisdom or understanding or counsel against the Lord. The horse is prepared for the day of battle. But deliverance is of the Lord. See, stop trying to tell God how much you know. Well, you need to deliver me like this, 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 and this. There's no counsel, no wisdom against God. That should bring you down to a humble place right there. Because deliverance is from God. That proverb, he turned me to that last night, and I read that, and I read that, and he says, stop trying to tell me how to do stuff. <laughs> I don't need your help, I need your obedience. Amen. What do you mean you don't need my help? Well, we've been through it together. What's the love on that? He didn't need my help. I can't believe it. What do you mean? He said, I need you to be obedient. I'll take care of the rest because it says so right here. Read that again. Read that again. And I read it again and again until he sunk it into my heart. Sometimes he'll have me read stuff two, three, four, five, six, seven times until it goes from here to here. Because once it's in your heart, now his word has taken root. Once his word takes root in your heart, like in Jeremiah 20, you should ask God to burn his word in your heart. Burn it in there. Because once that's burned in here, the living word, everything off your mouth is going to go out and it's going to build and it's going to edify and it's going to help set the captives free and lead those that are darkness into the glorious light of Jesus Christ. Because you need the word to be on fire inside of you. And you need to give it permission to do so. Oh, hallelujah. Put Amen. God in remembrance Amen. today. And all this will hallelujah, transpire Jesus. in you. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus. Remember that. Mm -hmm. Jesus, Jesus. Wow. You've been so trained, and so was I, to figure things. Some of you have more intense jobs than others. All my jobs were intense, from running trucking companies, to building cabinets, to running machine shops. Everything I did was always in management from the time I was in high school on. So you train to multitask. <clears throat> everything was photographic memory. A thousand things an hour, phones going, everything, right? Some of you are looking at me going, oh God, that's been me. Stop striving. No wisdom or counsel against God. He'll give you the wisdom. It says, cry out for discernment and understanding. Make wisdom your closest friend. That means Jesus is your closest friend. He'll give you all the wisdom you need on your jobs. He'll give you godly insight nobody working around you will have. Other people may have bigger diplomas and a bigger title. But when you've got godly wisdom, man can't come near that. Because God knows how to fly the shuttles. He knows how to build the jets. He knows how to build buildings. He knows how to operate computers. Heck, He gave us the abilities to make the stuff. You don't think He knows how to run them? Amen. Yes, He does. And every time I try and figure something out, this shuts off, and he goes, I'm not going to let you do it. Because you're too prideful to ask for help. <laughs> oh! Okay. Especially you men out here were filled with that male pride stuff. That needs to go away. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <geez. laughs> it was late last night. I knew I wasn't done. I said, I have something to show you. He is so good to us. Yes, he is. There's no words for it. 
how good God is to us and how much He loves us. There's no human words that we can share with Him that tell Him how good He is, how much He loves us, how great He is, how awesome He is, how glorious He is. We don't have human words. But He gave me a revelation last night about putting Him in remembrance and what He has done. Paul, at the end of his life, felt forsaken. David, why he was running for 13 years from King Saul, who God delivered him from, in and out of caves, hiding. Could have taken Saul down, but he said, no, he's God's anointed. The man's trying to kill you. You'll call him God's anointed. Oh, okay. <laughs> but he never rose a hand against Saul. Rejected, abandoned, hiding in caves. God anoints him for king, and then he's hiding. Takes Goliath's heads off. Now he's on the run. Okay, I got some issues there, right? But guess what? You're going to find out that you can never be forsaken and should never feel that. Never, never, never should you feel alone. You're going to find, I got a revelation last night. He gives me everything in pictures. He makes it really easy for me. Matthew 27. Give me some grace here, Lord. I told the Lord with His grace I could make it through this. Shows the power of His love for us and how close He is to us. What He went through on that cross. I told you so much happened in Calvary. We don't study it so we really don't know the power of this cross. It's that powerful. In Matthew 27, verses 45 and 46, <clears throat> Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with his loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama. Now look this up in the Bible dictionary. Some of these words, God's got to really work on it. It's sabak thani. That's it, I got it. You know what that word really means? Not my God, my God, why have you forsaken means thou hast left me. I looked it up in the Bible dictionary. Thou hast left me. When Jesus was on that cross, he asked the Father, why you've left me? The Father left him there, so we would never be left. We would never be forsaken. He said, I took the Father leaving, so you never will. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be by your side every step of the way. I looked that word up last night. I went, oh my God. It says, thou, Jesus hung on the cross with the sins of humanity. He said, Father, you've left me. He was left by the Father. The Father had to turn from the sin of humanity so that we will never be left alone. Never, never, never. Don't ever say, God, you've forsaken me because He can't. Because His Son made sure He can. God is always going to be here to hold you. There isn't a step you're ever going to take the rest of your days on earth. You can take this assurance. This whole world could forsake you, but He will never leave you. Never, 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 because Jesus did it for you. That word forsaken, God told me last night, should be out of your vocabulary. The whole world can leave you, but because of what I did on that cross, when the Father had to leave me to bear the brunt of the sin of humanity, that means I can never leave you. I can never forsake you. Take that, put that in your heart today. No matter what this world does, no matter what people say, no matter who walks away from you, the rest of your days on this earth, Jesus made sure you can never be forsaken. You're His blood what sanctified children of God. And He will never, ever. When I look at that word, it says, Thou hast left me. That changed the whole meaning, forsaken. It, it changed that whole word, forsaken. Thou hast left me. You will never be left alone by God because He took care of it at the cross. God loves us that much. I sat there last night. I thought I stopped breathing for a minute. He said, when I said those words, it is finished. So much more happened than my children realized. The Father had to leave me for me to break the power of sin so He will never leave you. Never, never, never will you be left alone by God. Ever. No matter what you do. Hallelujah, Jesus. Romans 3.23 You all fall short of the glory of God. All. Not some of us. All of us do. 
But God will never leave you because Jesus took care of it. Amen. Can you measure that love? No, you can't. No, we can't. We can't. You're clothed with glorious majesty today. Remember who you're clothed with. God will never leave you nor forsake you. Why hast thou left me? Can you imagine what the son, when he looked up at the father and said that? Because the father had to do this. Because he couldn't look on sin. Because nothing can touch it. Sin can't touch a holy God. It can't. That's how much you're loved today. Amen. That's how much why you should say, Oh God, how I need thee. And when you say that, I don't care if you have to say it 30 times today. When stuff comes at you in life, Oh God, how I need thee. God says He'll never leave you. Never, 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 never. Do not go to man for your help. Go to God for help. And He'll bring you help through man. Everybody looks to man. I told you, Tony Evans did a teaching. God's your resource of this life. Spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, intellectually, financially. God is your resource. Now, He'll bring you through a lot of different areas. But He's your resource. Amen. Because every good and perfect gift comes from heaven. God's not going to bring you something. It's not going to be a blessing to you and to those around you. Remember that. That's how much God loves you today. He wants you to know you are cherished. You are highly esteemed in heaven. You're a chosen generation for His glory. Put Him in remembrance in everything you put your hands to. And God will take you from there. Don't put your hands and go to everybody and go, what do you think? First of all, I don't want to know what people think. I want to know what God's told me. Amen. God showed me something, then you listen. Then you listen. Because God's going to bring you all the help you need. And He'll bring you through vessels you never saw coming. Because He may bring you a David. He may bring you a soul and you're going to go, that's going to help me? Really? You've got to be kidding. There's no counsel, no wisdom that can stand against God. Don't look at how He's going to do it. Thank Him that He is. Amen. Thank Him that He's going to bless you and take care of you and heal you and prosper you and deliver you from every form of darkness. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus. God is so good. Amen. 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 Mm. I made it through that. Didn't think of what I'm getting better. <laughs> Become a man of God, you cry more than you ever did before. <laughs> We've talked about that before. You're brought up not to cry, and then God softens your heart, and then that's pretty much what you do half the time. Yeah. Really? What's with that? Well, we're going to close here in a second. You should know me, I'm going to go down. God didn't give me these lungs just because. Uh, what are you hungry? Okay. <laughs> I just saying, isn't it? She's got her own lungs to speak. <laughs> what did I tell you about that husband and wife then? So much trying to touch some hearts in here today. You put your expectations in man. That's what some of you have done today. Your hope was in people. Humans are still humans. We got imperfections. Don't say it. <laughs> um, Stop trying to be perfect. But stop trying to put your hope out here. People aren't like you. God made you an individual. You're perfect just the way you are in God's eyes. All of you. Not some of you. All of you are. You made the image of Almighty God. All of you. Every one of you, when you look in the mirror, you should see who's dressed you today. You're clothed with Christ Jesus. That's how much He loves you. You talk about the armor of God, you got a robe of righteousness around you. That's the scepter of his kingdom, the Bible says. So the scepter of righteousness goes before you. Remember who's in you and around you and for you. Let him love you today. But stop putting all your hope in man. Stop listening to the TV, to the news, and to the computer. Because all that will do is defile what you are, a holy temple. 
In the, la in the last week, we've turned the TV on so little, it's almost time to just disconnect the little dish thing outside the house because it's pretty much worthless. Oh, I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm really close. They don't cut the bill in half. I think I'll just tell them to come take their dish. Uh, because it's really not worth watching anymore. Because the more I focus on Jesus, the more I realize this stuff's going to happen. Because the book says the famines, the earthquakes, the wars, the rumors of wars, all this stuff, nation against nation, it's here. But it's only the beginning of birth pangs. But the more I look at Jesus, you know what? The more peace I have about it. Because I know He's going to arise because in great persecution and great devastation, there's also a great move of salvation. People are tired of phony stuff out there. They're tired of emptiness. There's a hopelessness out there, but that hopelessness can only be filled with the life of Jesus Christ in them. So when you start seeing yourself who you really belong to today, and who owns you, and who is for you, and who goes before you, you'll quit fighting battles. You'll turn them over to God so you can get about your father's business. Let him go deal with all your enemies because he said he will. If David knew it and Paul knew it, how much more should we? Because we see their testimony of what God did in them and through them. We have it in print. We can read it every day. Excuse me. And when you do that, how can you not put him in remembrance? Like I said, I'm living proof that there's hope for everybody walking this planet. I'm a firm believer if anybody surrenders to Christ, there's hope for them. Because if there's hope for me, there's hope for everybody walking this planet. Don't sit there, they're all so evil, yes, so what, so were all of us before salvation, amen? Because God changed all of your hearts and that's why you're here today. Because if you hadn't changed your heart, you'd be home with your feet up on, uh, on, on the recliner having a beer or something. That's where you would be. But God changed your hearts because now you have a love affair with your maker. And not with the world. Hallelujah. Let God love you today. Bow your heads, close your eyes for a minute. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that the Father, you said, Father, thou hast left me, so that we will never be forsaken. God, we don't even know how to measure that kind of love. There's no words to describe it. You became forsaken, so we never will be. Oh, God, we praise you. We love you, Jesus. We need you every step we take on this earth. But Lord, we know you go before us. We know we don't have a battle down here because you've already overcome the world and all its powers. We walk in victory every step we take because you are God. And you are for us and you are in us. And you promised us all that you would lead us and guide us on that highway of holiness into eternal glory. But Lord, make our life have more meaning day by day. So that you use us more to spread the hope of the cross to lost humanity, O oh God. Father, I just pray a blessing upon everybody in here, that their hearts be open to the power of Thy love. Pour Your great grace in here, O oh God. Smile on everybody, O oh God. And Lord, when we leave here today, let us have a renewed passion, burning in our heart the living Word of God, so that everywhere we go, we can't but help, but share the name of Jesus and the saving grace of the cross of Jesus, Father. Lord, I just pray right now that it's a holiday today. A lot of people on the road, people even in here, that they'd be traveling mercy on everybody's going to celebrate Mother's Day with their families, oh God. Protect everybody on the highways, oh God. But Father, I just pray right now in Jesus' mighty and holy name that every wounded heart in here get touched by the power of Thy love because it is unconditional and it is immeasurable in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Oh, wow. Amen. He's touching a few of you right now. You're pushing your hand out. Don't. Don't push God away today. He loves you. He's here to heal you. He's come to heal the brokenhearted. Set the captives free. The pain you have in your heart is keeping you captive to where you've been. Jesus can heal you. I can't. Nobody else can. Only Jesus can. Let Him heal you today. Let Him love you today. I can't put into words what it does when you surrender your heart to God to let Him take pain now. It does something to you. It gives you a freedom that can't come from the world or things. It can come from the love of God coming to restore what the world has done to your heart. Hallelujah. Advocate.